really sorry, but we, sh we, we would never kill anybody, of course. And I, I found out later that this was a lie. I was arrested, but when I got out of jail, there was nobody. But anyway, he was saying that maybe they were telling them this to make them uh, like agitated against us. Uh, uh, so uh, then I heard this very authoritarian voice that was saying like, uh, Is that you? Get me this SOB. He was the chief of police in the area because I negotiated with him the release of activists before during the earlier protests that I told you about. And he knew me. So he said to me, like when they got me to him, I'm going to give you a lesson you will not forget for the next 40 years. And he told his guys to discipline me. So uh, someone took my glass and then smashed it like really bad. And I said like, why the glass? <laughs> But then that was the last thing I said, because uh, uh, they smashed my nose, which was a mistake on their side, because then I didn't feel the wrist. But of course, I have like flashes that four big guys were working really like with their hands and feet on me. And uh, I still have like an injury here from that, uh, that I'm, I'm going to have an operation to remove soon. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, my nose was smashed and so on, I kind of started to understand where the hell I was. I, I realized I was in a microbus. I didn't have my wallet on me and I'm bleeding like hell and stuff like that. And I was detained. And uh, a couple of days later, I was uh, put um, on front of a prosecutor to interrogate me in uh, South Sky reports. And I realized that there was a warrant for my arrest hold from the start. And it was not a random arrest. <laughs> Uh, there was uh, a warrant based on the, the, the investigation of state security officer called Shamil Aray who had uh, uh, made this warrant. The, the charges were masterminding a conspiracy to overthrow the regime and to attack police officers and to sabotage uh, public and private property and stuff like that. Um, so uh, the problem of course was I never wanted any sabotage or any attack on anybody. Of course, I wanted to overthrow the regime. So the best thing to do in this case is to deny everything. So I denied everything. So no, I was just going home. Then I, I saw some crowd. I wanted to see what's going on. I was attacked and somebody stole my wallet. And they, uh, they were in civilian clothes. And then I realized that I was arrested. Uh, so I was like asked a few questions why I was there at this hour and so on that I answered uh, the city was in chaos and uh, protests everywhere and I didn't know when should I start heading home so I thought when it's late it's safe you know until then it seemed to be going okay but then he told me but you were arrested several times before how do you explain that <laughs> so uh, I had to give the lame answer like uh, well, what, what can you do in this country? You walk anywhere, you get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> that made me believe I'm not going out. And it's over. Because, come on, anyway. that was so lame. I, I, it, but I just didn't know what else to say. <laughs> and uh, so I was sent back to the holding uh, prison. And uh, then uh, things seemed to be a little weird, and uh, security officers seemed to be kind of uh, not really themselves. Uh, a confusion, a disorder, and so on. And then we were divided into uh, I don't know, three groups or something. The guys that were in this place put in different trucks, in three trucks, and we were sent to three different destinations, and they let us out. Of course, I understood what was happening afterwards, but not at that time, because that was January 28th, the day the police failed. When the police failed, they didn't know what to do, so every bunch they had to do their own thing, which gave uh, some people a very bad fate, like some of the, of the people that were arrested, they were burnt alive or uh, wow. buried alive or stuff like that, they were killed while others, like in my case, were let free. So, thank goodness I was freed. Um, the, 
I, I, of course, I had no idea what the hell is going on. I didn't know if there is anything happening in the country. All I know was that something is weird happening, and I'm like, I'm out, and I have to try to get home. So trying to figure out where I was without talking to people because I looked very suspicious with all the blood. And, uh, I had no money, and there was no transportation anyway. There was nobody. And I didn't want anybody to see me because I didn't want to cause trouble. And anyway, somehow I started to figure out how to get in the direction of my home. I walked a very, very long way, and I thought I should go to a hospital near my house because it's the second biggest uh, 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 educational hospital in the country <coughs> to fix my nose because I cannot let my nose be like this. You know, it was like up there and smashed and all that blood, and I didn't know even how to clean the blood. I was afraid. And uh, <coughs> so I went there and I, like, I need help and stuff. He told me that the country is in total chaos and it had failed and they cannot help me. Come on, you cannot say that. Like, uh, I need to fix my nose. <laughs> 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 and I was very worried about it. Really. <laughs> Looks fine now. Looks good now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did a good job. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they said, like, no, sorry, there is no way that we can help you because seriously, we have nothing. So someone just one of the doctors he came to me and he wrote me on a paper an address of a place nearby and he said go there get just get them to get you a su support you know it's called such has a name i don't remember for the nose so we can fix it and i will do it for you but just go and get it because otherwise i can't do it so i went there i was begging them because i had no money until somebody actually was nice and kind to give it to me I went back to the hospital, that doctor was not there, so I had to pick other doctors until someone accepted to help me, and he said, okay, but I'm not going to do it with any anesthesia, we have no anesthesia, oh. we really have nothing, oh my so God. can you do it? And I said, like, okay, but at least could you get somebody to hold my head? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he did get somebody to hold my head, and he started working on it, which was a nightmare. Lots of very crazy sounds and, uh, you know, breaking and putting together and all this stuff. It was very weird. Very bad. Very disturbing. Uh, but finished, finally. Like, everything. Uh, Nose looks gets... great. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. They did a good job. Absolutely. So, I, I went back home wanting to check what's really going on. Because nobody's really telling me in details what's going on. All I know is it's all gone to hell. There is no internet. Oh my god, did they get my internet? <laughs> okay, so I was too tired even to shower, clean up, just slept. And uh, then I woke up in the early morning, so I showered and I thought I'd go to Tahrir. So I arrived not to Tahrir to the next stop in the metro, in the underground, because the metro didn't stop at Tahrir, which seemed like strange. I didn't know yet what was happening. So I, I got off at that next uh, stop, it was like 8 o'clock in the morning and I walked across the bridge, across the Nile, to go into Tahrir. And as I was getting into the area, the stench of the tear gas was still out in the air very strongly from the battle of the night before. The fires were everywhere, blood, you have pools of blood all around. It was a total war zone. And I took a couple of pictures actually. The first, the only picture I have in the revolution, in Tahrir, is this one. But then I, a, 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 a French TV had sent me a DVD with uh, the, some filming they did with me during the 18 days. With, of course, my face wrapped with uh, the bandages and so on. So I have this DVD. Several other TV stations were uh, getting me to speak on them, especially British uh, stations like... Uh, uh, BBC4 and Sky News and things like that. So I appeared regularly there. If anybody knows anyone who has been watching that, and uh, they, they they should remember that they saw the the, the, the guy with the band the bandages on his face. The guy with no face. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then uh, I heard uh, somebody shouting, people shouting that. People are getting killed by the Ministry of the Interior, so we all ran <laughs> to the Ministry of the Interior because, of course, in this revolution, until now, when there is danger, people do not run away from the danger, they run to the danger. So, 
we just ran there and I did the stupid thing of actually stepping into the fire range. So I stepped out of the safe street into Mohammed Mahmoud Street where the snipers were. And as soon as I went in, I realized that there were all these fires and that there are protesters that come and try to throw stones and run away and things like that. As I was looking, you know, around still trying to figure out what I'm going to do now I'm, I'm here, I was hit with this rubber bullet which is still in my head, so it knocked me to the ground. It's still in your head? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a souvenir, yeah. Well, why should I take it away? You're a <laughs> why should I take it away? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. It's not disturbing me, it's like if you press it, it disturbs, but then it's, it's okay because there is no need to press it. What's disturbing me is this here because I, so I have this injury here that I'm gonna fix. Uh, Sorry about anyway, that. so uh, I, it kind of it knocked me to the ground, and then when I was on the ground, in a very uncomfortable position, of course, a guy that was more in the, in the middle of the street, his head was blown with a live ammunition bullet. You know, it's like his head was Shit. fucking. You know, his brains were out, and uh, so it was lying dead, just a couple of steps away from me, and I was still. I'm able to uh, comprehend what's going on because of the hit on my head and because of this scene and then I started hearing this sound. Uh, at the first few times I didn't really understand what it was until I started to see the dust that is associated with this sound. So I understood it was the same sniper playing cat and mouse with me. He's shooting around, waiting for me to move. So I start. I, I understood that. Okay, once I start, I try to get up. I'm I'm dead. <laughs> and in this surreal situation, what can you do? I was just watching wherever the bullets hit. You know, <laughs> when the dust comes. And, <laughs> and I was trying to see like, where the hell is he? You know, <laughs> from on the buildings. <laughs> because I couldn't hear the bang of the the firing sound. I I, I could only get the yeah. But then someone actually came from behind me and pulled me to safety, which saved my life because I was on, at the edge of the street. So uh, without this person, I would have been totally dead. I would have been, you know, under. Uh, yeah, and uh, that was my beginning with uh, the rest of the 18 days. And uh, we started to work on organizing uh, the hardcore revolutionary groups and new ones that have come in without political activism or affiliation. So we started something called the Coalition of the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, which I, I lead. And because it's based on total decentralization, several groups have kind of come out of that, while other groups have been formed also in the same line. And these are the ones composing the hardcore revolutionary on the ground, where there is no leader, uh, the leader is the idea, the goals, and we all are equal and partners. Anyone with a good idea can be heard, and the idea that seems more in accordance with our goals is taken. <coughs> and this is how the revolution has been continued until now. There are all those unknown groups by the media or deliberately ignored groups by the media who are doing the fight on the ground who are to a great extent working <coughs> together in harmony because we don't have problems of competition or whatever and there are those political movements and groups including my own old movement april 6 who are all trying just to take credit of stuff and to be on the media and to hijack things and to play uh, sometimes dirty games with the authorities by condemning set ends that we do or say ah these are not revolutionaries they do not represent us of course they, we don't they, they don't uh, we don't represent them like who are they 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 go to their studios and they comfort to their homes where are they in the street and uh, yeah and many uh, of those very good friends have been martyred they were killed in the fight the last one that was a good friend of mine that was killed was killed about three or four days ago uh, 
he is he was shot like in the mouse history or yeah and, and uh, while we were putting the ministry of defense under siege <laughs> yeah which uh, of course they uh, they totally uh, brutalized yesterday <coughs> and arrested hundreds of people uh, yeah so the lessons maybe learned from all this is there is always hope even when we totally give up we in many occasions were only uh, a few really like a handful and it was always up to the very few to start again because you start you grow you fail and it seems over but you have to continue as long as you keep fighting you're not defeated you're only defeated when you stop that's great that's great so it's very important other lessons that are learned we would have to work on the, the ways to get the real people to do the fight. So we cannot work with hierarchies. We should not expect to put everybody together in one organization or movement or group. People can be as different as they wish, but still work together because we have the same goals. <laughs> We could have different approaches sometimes, or the same, depending on how we would see these paths that are trying to take us to that destination, this strategic goal. And uh, it's just very important that we keep that, we understand that, and we have this respect for each other. It's also very important to understand that there are always two versions of every reality. One that is real and one that is totally fake and fabricated. And if we want to really study and learn what really works, we should have a, an investigative mind. We should use common sense and logic. And we should try to investigate in order to see what are the successes, what are the mistakes so we can learn. In our case, if I would speak about what had worked and what hadn't, I have discovered that quite a few of the things that we have taken for granted before because we have been learning these things over and over again, they do not have to be the same truth because people's nature changes over history. Probably the revolution had to be coming from the pro proletariat upon some time in history because the world was different at that time. But the world now, in order to have an effectiveness, we would have to target, or at least this is in our case, those who have the following specifications. Education, it's necessary. A little bit of education, illiteracy doesn't help much. Awareness, one has to be aware of the problem, where it comes from, and what is the possible way to solve it, even if they can't solve it, even if they think they can solve it, because this is our job to get them to know that they can. Three, they would have to have a strong point of reference. I don't know how to explain this, like a strong ground to stand on, a little independence, a little freedom. It's very hard when a father has to feed his children to expect them to go on the front line and die. Yes, many of them dead, many dead, many died, and they left their children orphans, but still it's hard. So we have to try to target those who are more independent those who seem to have a little bit of money on the side so they can support themselves while they are in the fight. Because if you have no money at all, how can you eat and how can you fight? You will be weak and you can be co-opted or defeated. <coughs> the other thing is solidarity. We all have to work together. We may dislike each other, we may disagree with each other, but we are brothers in arms. We stand on the same lines. On the same lines, in Tahrir, you would have the 
Islamist, and the atheist, the, the, the Christian, the liberal, and the, the, the Trotsky, and the, 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 the leftist, like all kinds of people, every color of people, standing as one. Everyone is trying to save the others, sacrificing their lives for the others. This spirit we see, not every, not all the time, but we see in major events. Whenever we have a major event, the people that go there, they bring the spirit back. During the clashes around the Ministry of Defense in the last four days, the spirit existed. It was incredible. So you had the Muslims and the Christians, the atheists, the all people from the different backgrounds fighting together and dying. Males and females, young and old, rich and poor. Solidarity is very important. We have to understand it doesn't matter if we are different. What matters is we're in the same fight. If I get to the problems that the Occupy movement seem to face, one of the most important problems, actually there are very, there are two very important problems, so I'm starting with one, is being alienated by the rest of the society. Being considered like, what the hell are you doing guys? Go get a job, get a life. <laughs> you know, exactly. yeah. I got in that one. <laughs> okay, the, don't worry about it. This is very normal. I have to explain a couple of points about that. First, about societies, and second, about how can we work around them and actually gain numbers instead of losing sympathy. So, every society in the world. Here, in Egypt, in China, in Central African Republic, in Sweden, it's all the same. We humans are the same. Not in money, not in culture, but we are the same in nature and spirit. People are divided into two major groups, 80% and 20%. 80% mainstream, they follow. They want to do things like that, that can be accepted by everybody. They want to do their dirty things behind, away, you know, from everybody. And they just like to have this role of being mainstream. Those people can be good and can be bad. They can be wonderful or they can be awful. Because they are humans. They are our brothers and sisters and parents and children. There is nothing wrong with that, but they will never join the fight. When you know someone is a mainstream person, forget about trying to get them to the front. <coughs> then there is 20%. 20% they have a different kind of spirit. They have an individual spirit. They want to be different. They don't know how to be different. Maybe some of them will put colors on their hair. Maybe some of them <laughs> will go out and, uh, I don't know, uh, paint graffiti uh, and do whatever. They want to be different. Some of them can be very wonderful like Gandhi. Some of them can be very terrible, like Hitler and Mussolini and Saddam Hussein. Because, of course, you would have to be a strong person to make a strong good or evil. So, those 20% are our target. Who are we? We are the 0.001%. <laughs> We are the crazy guys that want to make change in the world. That's right. And if we look at the history of the world, it was always up yes. to that tiny, right. little minority to create change. And when were they able to make change? When they were able to recruit the 20%, as much as they could of the 20%. Then change could happen. But never when they get a majority. Never in history. Okay? Uh, the thing that I would like to tell you about this alienation thing, we can start with something that can be very effective, which is 
there are all these different groups fighting all these different battles now all these battles they are very legit because they are about combating problems that people are subjected to now if we only can listen to them show them our support and then in a clearly logic discussion based on this dialectic system of trying to figure out what is the origin of the problem we would always see that they can come to the conclusion that their cause is an effect of another cause and because of this if they want to work on their cause they have to do two things trying to deal with the effect as in dealing with symptoms of a disease and trying to deal with the origin of the disease this is the message that has to be a conclusion that they get to because it's logic they are saying if they are if they use rationality and common sense small discussion five to ten minutes can get whoever to understand that which means that again we can get back to the point of different groups working horizontally for the same goals so we are trying to get these different groups into believing that the best way to solve their own problem is to solve the bigger problem as well which is not bullshitting anybody because this is the fact we are only trying to bring it to their attention so we try to do that and this would mean that you have so many different groups that are on the same side but then to do what we will have to have goals strategic goals so that people can take the different tactical steps that are needed in order to reach those strategic goals the strategic goals of course they lay in most cases on one issue fixing the electoral system here meaning more vote registration so people can vote more second is to create pressure so that corporates will not have the upper hand when it comes to funding the campaigns right and anybody can no. understand sorry these are not the goals you can tell me more goals <laughs> yes no 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 because the, the thing is that the electorate is actually completely bought off the, the problem is within the banking and the, uh, the financial system and the corporations that have basically bought out the electric process. Does that make sense? Have bought it. No, 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 but it's, it's almost like a dictatorship. It's yeah, yeah, like but a... exactly this is what we need to fix. We need to it's fix not... the funding of the... That and to unseat those powers. We need to also Sorry. unseat the bankers and the... Uh, yeah, 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 but uh, to do this, I mean, you will have to work on step by step. Yeah. Look, I have to tell you something. In strategy, what you do is the following. You have a strategic achievable goal. And you have smaller strategic goals. And you have many tactical steps in order to get there. If you can reach your achievable strategic goal, then you take that as a strong platform for another achievable strategic goal because you have to do this otherwise the situation will be like this i am trying to i don't know empty the bay water with a spoon like what what i'm what i'm doing you know like where, where how can we get there how can we convince anybody that what we're doing can lead somewhere we have to have clear points that we need work on so yes different smaller organizations of consensus instead of voting and so I just wondered if you speak to that okay. right so strategic okay. goal yeah yeah okay so this is one of the, the two problems as I have mentioned uh, there was another problem yeah yeah just the I kind the electoral of lost process. The... Electoral process. No, no, there was something else. That there was. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Uh, well, anyway, so uh, we, we, we could just go on. 
Russians and Russians because I lost the track of money and politics. Sorry? You're at money and politics, right? Money and politics. Yeah, then you're saying that's you gotta get voters registered and Voter, more voters should be registered. This is very important so that you can use numbers to defend their causes and defend their interests and to ch try to shift the balance a little bit from the corporates to the people. This is one. On the other hand, you get all these groups to do continuous demand for a change in the rules so that no longer it is possible to have unlimited, you know, uh, uh, contributions uh, in, in the way that we see sometimes in these campaigns, whether uh, uh, clean or unclean ways. And yes. How do we get past the problem that the people who are running for office are only people who have money and are bought out by corporations. So even if you register to vote, you don't have like. Yeah, but if if exactly you are if exactly you are able to beat that first problem that they cannot have these huge amounts of money, then their advantage will not be that big because like it's not only the wealthy is the one that is being funded by this in most cases. Yes, sir. When you. Uh, no, okay. Uh, when you talked about uh, playing a reporter in order to talk to individuals about uh, uh, a movement and an action, uh, how many of those individuals did you talk to personally? And how many, like... You mean like how many people I spoke that day? Yeah. I spoke to a huge number of people, at least a couple of hundred. I did that from noon until about seven o'clock until I was totally tired and my feet couldn't hold me anymore and I felt very heavy because I felt frustrated and not a single one knew about it and like it was crazy. <laughs> Do you think that was a major uh, a major uh, tool to bring that many people in these, these interviews that you were doing? No, no, I don't think it helped to bring really much. But the, the, it was a good lesson to try to figure out how to solve the problems, like to really pinpoint the problem, to understand how it is, and to see how can we get around it and we can He's solve just it. Shit, it helped you. You want the truth? It helped you get a sense of how people felt. Like how people who weren't the corruption. as committed as you are. Uh, you feel the of the public. Uh, it helped me understand if they like or dislike the regime and why. It helped me to understand if they are going to ever take part in any protest and how. Which seemed to be impossible at the moment because they only they only do it if they would see others out on the street. But then there was a solution finally. Um, you, you you started this with saying there was two main problems. And the yeah, yeah, exactly. I was trying to get to the other problem. Oh, the other but problem is the one that you can't. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to remember. So one is being... Oh, yeah, yeah, there is another one. This other problem is... Social destruction. It's related to the fact that occupiers, they tend to show their political ideology a lot. Uh, occupiers they tend to show their political ideology a lot which is a very heavy problem and a very big problem because it contradicts what most people think as being apolitical or being even political but within the system they would be suffering problems but they would see that you are trying to impose a political ideology so they are not going to be with you because they are on their own thing they're not buying communism so what I'm saying is, what we are doing is no politics. This is how we fight. You can believe anything that you want, or not believe, have a political view or not, it doesn't matter. We all agree on the basic important things. In our case, freedom, justice, equality, democracy. This is what we want. Goals and targets in order how to achieve this by removing the military, by putting a presidential civilian council for temporal purposes, by having an interim government in order to start purging the different ministries and so on, and to have an election and to have 
uh, a democracy. The same must be here. There has to be a clear set of goals that can be accepted by everybody, whether they are Democrats, even Republicans, even Tea Party, even God knows what, because like you can talk to them, but don't you see that this affects your life? Don't you see that this affects your home? Don't you see you could lose your home? Don't you see that you could have this or that? Aren't you feeling the problem? Help us solve the problem for everybody. And you can win the elections. Who cares? In Egypt, do you think that the Muslim Brotherhood is trying to co-opt uh, you know, people like you? And are they succeeding at it? No, the Muslim Brotherhood are not co-opting anybody. They are co-opted by the military. They are not co-opting anybody. Yeah. Let's go, Jerry.